So, okay, I will go with the method digestibility, but first my, my disclosure. Okay, this is the disclosure for the, for the conference. I will receive, I will receive refund <laughs> travel expenses for my, for my trip. Um, this is my, my disclosure, personal disclosure. I have a research founded by, I had actually, I still have a research founded by two companies, two, two food companies in Italy. I have now speaker on and so on. Then I'm employee of the University of Parma, and uh, my department is involved in research and technological transfer uh, with a number of food companies, including testing glycemic index. I'm also the pro tempore president of the Italian Society of Human Nutrition, and in this case, when I do conferences and, con and congress, I have support from a pharmaceutical, uh, food, uh, scientific publisher, and so on. Uh, finally, my sponsor is a, is a scientific officer of the EFSA NDA panel, and this is a key on factor of interest, of course. Um, to mitigate the potential bias, I, the data that I'm, I'm presenting here are mainly derived by published uh, literature. Uh, if I present something which is not uh, published, um, there is no reference to manufacturer, distributor of the product, or whatever, uh, which involves uh, uh, grants obtained by the industry. And uh, of course, this lecture is, uh, is my personal point of view about the topic. Uh, I don't endorse any uh, service, so, uh, drugs, foods, ingredients, instruments, reagents, and so on, um, that could be that could present a commercial interest. And to resolve the last point of my disclosure, I only discuss about food at home in deciding what to prepare for dinner. <laughs> Nothing more than that. Okay, uh, talking about in vitro methods, uh, in, vitro, in vitro digestibility and, and uh, marker of uh, carbohydrate quality, um, we all know that uh, reducing post prandial glucose uh, is a uh, uh, um, a good story is a good effect, has a good physiological effect. Sorry, ah, here. Yeah. Uh, is important, pardon, is, is a very important, and this both uh, at the level of the, um, diabetic patients but also in the general population. Uh, so, um, how we can achieve a reduced postprandial <coughs> blood glucose um, mainly in two ways. Um, either by um, increasing, no, improving the glucose disposal, uh, for example, with the use of drugs such as insulin enhancer agents, or by reducing the rate of gluco or glucose absorption from food. And this is the other side of the coin. So we can slow the glucose entrance into the circulatory system. So two different aspects that could have the same effect, reducing the postprandial glycemia. Uh, if we use a proof of concept, a drug as a proof of concept, we see that reducing postprandial glycemia, uh, glycemia through the uh, reduction of the rate of glucose absorption has a preventive effect on, uh, major, um, on major diseases in, uh, in IGTs, whereas um, uh, the use of some insulin enhancers, as, such as the teglinide, um, at the long term has no effect. So they have, of course, a uh, useful effect in reducing the overall glycemia, the glycemic level, also the many consequences of um, uh, glycation of proteins, but not in preventing new cases of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So it seems that, this is the learning tip one, it seems that from drug studies, we can um, affirm that limiting the rate of glucose absorption may have additional advantages on the disease risk compared to just the reduction of postprandial glycemia per se. So it's something that goes behind uh, the reduction of postprandial glycemia. So that's what affects the rate of glucose entrance into the body. Of course, the digestive tract. So we chew the foods, pass in the stomach, then the proximal small intestine, the distal small intestine, and what is left arrives to the colon, and those are the possible point of control of the mechanism of digestion, especially when carbohydrates are involved. So the, the nature of the food, chewing, slow, swallowing, the emptiness of stomach, the rate of digestion, proximal absorption, 
distal absorption and the release of incretins and colonic intestinal peptides, and then chronic fermentation at the end. All these are interconnected. So we can measure, more or less, any one of these points. Uh, we can measure gastric emptying. Uh, we already know something about the mechanisms which can influence gastric emptying. And we know also that gastric emptying is dependent on the presence of certain um, compounds in the food, such as viscous fiber, especially for liquid foods. And we also know something about the postprandial glycemia, how it's changed by gastric emptying change. Um, digestion absorption rate, which is the topic of this talk, of, of course, we can measure it in vitro. Uh, there are many different ways to measure absorption. Um, is influenced by a lot of, a number of, of, of um, dietary factors uh, and uh, influence the rate of delivery of glucose to portal circulation. It depends on physical state of foods, on the presence of certain fibers, but also on cooking or on the presence of enzyme inhibitors. Uh, and the last, fermentation. Fermentation, we can measure more or less fermentation by in vitro techniques, but also by in vivo methods, such as the breath, breath hydrogen or in vivo serum acetate. Uh, is influenced by the nature of the substrate which is fermented, the particle size of the fiber, and can influence, you know, in turn, a lot of um, physiological aspects which are linked to peripheral use of glucose, such as peripheral removal or gluconeogenesis of free fatty acid suppression. It's dependent mainly by the concentration of fermental of fibers, including also the, the non-fiber, uh, uh, such as the uh, Mm, oligofructans, for example, and, uh, but also from malabsorption, for example, a lactasia, uh, so a certain amount of lactose is, is lost to the colon, even in lactose digester, or the fructose load, a lot of fructose can, can, can reach the colon. And then uh, we don't know, so no, we are not a, a clear picture of the effect on prostatic glycemia or chronic fermentation. We only can hypothesize that the system is more complex than what we are normally thinking. So this is the postprandial glycemia, which is mainly linked to the rate of glucose entrance into the system. And this is the postprandial glycemia, which is uh, related to the glucose disposal from the system. The two things are interconnected. And also the digestive tract you know, is interconnected in modulating these two aspects. For example, proximal absorption you know, increase the rate of glucose absorption, whereas distal absorption or fermentation increase the rate of glucose disposal, you know, or the effect on gastric emptying, which is in turn related to a slower entrance of food into the intestine. So the picture is quite complex. And uh, the learning tip two that I bring to you is that gastrointestinal physiology is closely linked to glucose metabolism with many points of possible interaction, not just one, not just digestion, not just gastric emptying. There are many points. Methods exist to systematically explore some of these points, not all, and factors which affect carbohydrate appearance in the bloodstream you know, are more or less um, you know, into this picture. Uh, so digestion, digestibility of carbohydrates, which is the topic. Uh, how digestion you know, is, can be measured in vitro to try to, you know, to explore at least the mechanisms which are, have been just described. Um, first of all, carbohydrate digestibility, which is the title of my talk. Uh, what does it mean? You know, how measures the term digestibility? Two things, the rate of digestion and the extent of digestion. So when we talk about use the same term, but we have a, a, double, meaning, a double meaning. Rate of digestion, that means a proxy for proximal or distal absorption of glucose, extent of digestion, which is a proxy for colonic fermentation, so the two block of my, of my picture. Uh, we do not discuss this part, because it uh, has already been discussed before from, you know, from, from who talk about fiber or, or grain, and we remain concentrated on the digestibility of carbohydrates related to the rate of digestion. So this is just a, a, a short summary of in vitro methods which have been applied to uh, predict the digestibility 
of foods or foods in general containing carbohydrates. Uh, more than 37 are, has been reviewed by, by this guy in 2008. Um, those methods have been used in a large, large amount of papers, applied in a large amount of papers to analyze thousands of ingredients and products. It's a very large body of information that we have, but often are not information which can be used to predict something in terms of the effect on human health, just the effect on, on, on some parameters. Um, again, all these methods have the same final point, which is to measure uh, different parts of the carbohydrates which are containing the food. Uh, with in vitro method, we can measure dietary fiber, we can measure in, in the starch the part which is resistant to, you know, which reach the colon, the part which is slowly digestible, which is absorbed in the distal part of the intestine, and the part which is rapidly digested. And we also, with imitometer, can, um, let's say, discriminate between the, the, the carbohydrates which are absorbed very, very fast and carbohydrates which are absorbed more slowly. Polyols are a, a sort of you know, black hole in the classification of carbohydrates. We don't know very well uh, neither the bioavailability nor the site of absorption nor the effect on fermentation. It's something that should be explored a bit more. Um, learning tip. Three, in vitro methods may describe both aspects of carbohydrates, the extent or the rate of carbohydrate digestion. In vitro rate of carbohydrate digestion is mainly related to the rate of, of starch digestion and provides a proxy of proximal versus distal glucose absorption. And among these methods, the English method has been no, recently, recently, 20 years now, proposed <coughs> to um, uh, make some order in the different fractions that of carbohydrates that can be, can be uh, um, uh, used by, by uh, coming from food and to predict some effect that food have on, for example, postprandial glycemia. Uh, what is interesting to note is that uh, Anglis, when uh, wrote the, his paper, his seminal paper, uh, was looking at the rapidly available glucose. So it was concentrating on the early absorption, on the fast absorption, which is found uh, the major determinant of the glycemic response. So the correlation that he found with the glycemic index was highly significant. So the in vitro method was able to predict the glycemic index. And the significance of in vitro measurement uh, was uh, um, endorsed by, by his paper. Um, and this uh, indeed has been also <coughs> a point of, of, of um, taken by EFSA when they, okay, when they, when they passed the recent uh, uh, claim on, uh, uh, on digestible starch and postpandal glycemia, which is a, a slow uh, reduction of postpandal glycemia, is a, a, a beneficial effect for, for EFSA. Sorry, I'm breaking something. Um, we can note that um, whereas the paper of Angris was focusing on the rapidly available glucose, uh, here, um, in turn, what is more stressed is the presence of slowly digestible starch, mm. which is some sort of uh, reciprocal effect, but it is exactly not, not the same effect that we're looking at the, in, the, in, the original, in the original paper. Anyways, this is a, a way that I can pass you as a learning tip four. In vitro methods may provide a measurable ground for claiming the effect of food on glycemic response, has been done. Um, based on quick availability of carbohydrates, mainly starch for intestinal absorption. This should be the, the meaning of an in vitro method of starch digestibility, or carbohydrate digestibility for predicting the glycemic response. Um, this is quite interesting. I, I, uh, when it's been published this paper, I was, <laughs> it was the time I was in Toronto, and swallowing food without chewing, a simple way to reduce postprandial glycemia. Uh, this is an interesting paper. I, I suggest you to read it. So this is wheat corn, potato, rice, apple, you know, eaten either by chewing them 15 times or by swallowing you know, small pieces of food without, without chewing them. 
And you can see a, a major effect on reduction of postprandial glycemia. If I could measure the glycemic index here, we have a, a glycemic index which is very, very low. Um, so why, why this picture? Because in effect, uh, uh, structure is almost all when we talk about in vitro digestibility and the in vivo consequence of fast glucose absorption. Just to, to make it clear, um, in, the, in the trial, uh, the ring test of Tom in 2003, we tested five foods, and I some left over. I used them for uh, doing some in vitro study just to see if I could predict the glycemic index that we found at the end uh, as, a, as, a, as a pool of, of labs. And I tested them to, in, twice. One in the, uh, the way they are eaten. Hmm? Uh, what we see, we see that the slope of the initial in vitro digestibility, which is the, the fast glucose release in the first 20 minutes, 25 minutes, is, is very different and correlates pretty well. It explains 91% of the difference in the glycemic index observed for the same foods. So the, the, a very easy method to measure just the, the initial rate of glucose digestion or glucose release or start digestion uh, in uh, foods as eaten uh, is able to predict uh, the, glycemic, the glycemic index. Um, however, when we repeat the experiment by grinding the samples finely, so using them as a, as a powder, uh, what we see is that the slope is exactly the same, and there is no relationship with the glycemic index apart. So there is no difference from the starch origin. There is a difference, and we'll see it later, for barley. Barley as a, as a, is, a, is an odd point here, and we'll see later why. Um, so the factor which affect the rate of glucose absorption um, uh, pardon, the, the characteristics of, 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 of foods which are related to the postprandial glycemia seems related to the, to the structure of the food. If I meal it, they disappear. The relationship disappears. This was a, a paper from, from Rosalba in a group of Naples uh, where uh, different Italian foods based on wheat were studied. There is no pasta here, but there is bread. Uh, gnocchi, pizza, and uh, rusks, and so on. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, the postprandial glucose, uh, glucose response are more or less similar apart for um, uh, potato dumplings. And the digestibility uh, shows exactly the same. Potato dumplings have a lower rate of digestion. So there is a highly significant dif difference between potato dumplings and the other uh, wheat-based foods, uh, mainly due to the a reduction in the digestibility of starch. Uh, how can we explore better what happens? So sometimes to be able to see the, no, uh, helps to understand. And what we did it was a, a, a scanning electron microscopy you can see that potato dumplings have a completely different structure compared to the other foods. Uh, and especially, and especially the, the, the compact structure without holes, without you know, porosity, you know, is um, explaining the fact that starch is impaired in, uh, in the accessibility to our families. So the learning tip five is in vitro methods provide an explanation for the main mechanism of action so can be used to explore, to explore the mechanisms of action which are linked to the glycemic response, for example, structure, and also if we can also use some new techniques such as image analysis, you know, we can get, gather further evidence that the nature of starch has not so much importance. What is really important is the food structure. Mm. Uh, going back to the barley, you know, the barley effect. Barley is here even if it's completely milled. So there is something in barley which has to do with the digestibility of starch. And of course, this factor is the fiber, barley fiber, beta glucans, which is a highly soluble fiber. Um, so we tried to do some, just an experiment to see if you could predict easily without a lot of, you know, 
the, the, the effect of barley fiber to the, on the digestibility of barley starch. So we prepared a few, a few breads you know, containing uh, increasing amount of barley, barley beta-glucans, um, and uh, we measure the glycemic index, but also a new marker, which is a sort of very easy, practical way to measure viscosity. I finished, yep. <laughs> uh, which is the fluidity of the chemo, of the, of the digested, or the digester of this bread. Uh, how can you do that with a very practical equipment, which is a boss viscosimeter? It's not a viscosimeter, it's a dense, uh, how uh, you say that? Oh, yeah. I don't know the name in English. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool which is used in the tomato industry to measure the density of the tomato paste. Uh, the tomato paste is put into this chamber. There is a guillotine which closes the chamber. Then when you open, you measure the time that you know, the paste employs to pour out. And uh, it's the same with the digester. Actually, if you think about the... You know, the, a particulate matter such as the food which is the being chewed and digested in the stomach, how it comes out, uh, how it interacts into the intestine is almost the same. And in effect, this is the you know, increasing amount of barley beta-glucans, this is the white bread as a control, and this is the glycemic index measure for the, for the foods, which is a perfect relationship. So I would say that with a very simple um, way to apply an in vitro system of digestion, which includes also measure of viscosity, we can have an information which can explain also the odds of fi soluble fiber-rich foods. Um, this is the last one, I guess. Um, fiber is always good in decreasing the uh, digestibility of carbohydrates. Not, not always. This is a, a paper published by a Spanish group, uh, what they found. They found that increasing fiber in bread uh, with, uh, by increasing bran has no effect on digestibility. However, has no positive effect. It increased, actually, the digestibility of bread. And um, so the normal thought that the whole meal bread has a lower glycemic index, mm, I, I would not put my arm on it. And also, by looking at the structure, they found, in effect, that insoluble fiber, insoluble fiber present in bran, disrupt and dilutes the gluten network and weakens the interaction between starch and gluten. So uh, opens more room for the enzymes to, to break down the starch. So the learning tip six is the effect of dietary fiber on glucose availability vary according to the type and the food. Um, so dietary fiber is not always the same. And simple in vitro digestibility methods, which can be also integrated with image analysis or viscosity measures, can help, may help to predict this effect. So the overall conclusions are that postprandial glucose response is affected by how food are handled in different parts of the gastrointestinal tract, not just the small intestine. In vitro carbohydrate digestibility may represent a marker of carbohydrate quality. Yes, it may very well do it. Industrial and domestic food processing are often the major determinant of digestibility and can be also used by the consumer, to by the industry, by the consumer also to manipulate starch digestibility and those the effect of carbohydrate food on postprandial glycemia. And finally, dietary advice on carbohydrate food selection may benefit from information from in vitro methods, but however, we have to keep in mind that in vivo data remain paramount to understand the real long-term effect. Thank you for your attention.